everybody, welcome to my channel and welcome to the second episode of my new history series all about the surprising and rich history of asexuality. Last episode was all about the virgin goddesses of ancient Greece and how I interpret them to be asexual and aromantic. And honestly, thank you guys so much for all the support on that video. It did a lot better than I thought it would. And I'm really glad that it's a topic that resonated with other people. And if, so if you haven't seen that episode and it sounds interesting to you, then you can click the card above. Today we're taking a pretty big jump forward in history all the way to the 19th century. The main focus today is the early research done into asexuality throughout the late 19th and early 20th centuries and how the term gradually came to be coined. Definitions and terms used for asexuality is something that's going to be touched on pretty much throughout every episode. It was something that constantly evolved and we grew a better understanding of it throughout time. On top of that, I'm also going to be discussing a few famous asexual figures who you probably didn't know were asexual. The series in its entirety is going to be about five episode songs, so subscribe to make sure that you don't miss it. So why is there such a big time jump in history? We were in ancient Greece last episode. There's a lot of factors to consider when answering that question. Of course, asexuality existed throughout all of history, but considering it's only been within the past maybe 20 years that people have actually formed a comprehensive understanding of it, people wouldn't have known what it was if they were experiencing it nor was it something talked about. Throughout majority of cultures and majority of times, sex wasn't really an option for people. In most cases, you had to be married and you had to reproduce. And in a lot of cases where there were forced marriages or marriages of really young girls to older men, there likely wasn't much sexual attraction going on within these relationships in the first place. It's hard for history to survive, and it's not like evidence of asexuality can be hidden within the walls of an ancient ruin. The evidence likely died with the feelings of asexual people who maybe couldn't write what they were feeling into words or only shared their feelings amongst their close friends. And it's worth noting that throughout different societies and different times, there were ways to escape from marriage. Whether it was the Vestal Virgins of ancient Rome or militaristic opportunities or joining the nunnery, there were potential ways for you to escape sexual relationships. And this may have been where some asexuals, particularly sex-repulsed asexuals, fled to. One of the earliest terms used to describe what we can now interpret to be asexuality was coined by German theorist of sexuality and gay rights activist Magnus Hirschfeld. Magnus Hirschfeld was a German sexologist born in 1868, and he began studying sexuality, particularly homosexuality, in 1896. He believed that sexual orientation was innate and not a deliberate choice, and that scientific understanding of sexuality would promote tolerance of sexual minorities. He was doing amazing work for his time. In his work, Sappho on Socrates, he coined the term sex anesthesia, which was an early description of asexuality. Doctors in the 19th century began to diagnose people with sex anesthesia, or sex coldness, essentially diagnosing people with asexuality. It's crazy to think this is how asexuality was once interpreted, but hey, someone came up with a term that kind of acknowledged the fact that we existed, so that's still a step. Magnus Hirschfeld did a lot of important activist work for the understanding of sexuality, establishing the Scientific Humanitarian Committee, the first gay rights organization. But as the world grew darker in Hitler's rise to power, it was becoming increasingly dangerous for him to continue this work. He died in 1935. Another German sexologist named Emma Tross gave one of the first definitions of asexuality. In her 1897 work, A Woman, Psychological Biological Study of a Contrary Sexual, making her the first woman to publish scientific work on homosexuality in women. In it, she refers to asexuality as asexuality, or this word in German. And in the footnotes of this, it says, author has the courage to admit to this category. So Emma Tross identified as asexual. Another German gay rights activist, Karl Schlegel, acknowledged the existence of asexuality in his 1907 speech. The speech was given in the US, in which he advocated for the same laws for homosexuals, heterosexuals, bisexuals, and asexuals. According to OutHistory.org, this inclusion of bisexuality and asexuality was the earliest known US bid for these groups' legal equality. Magnus Hirschfeld, Emma Tross, and Karl Schlegel did amazing early activism work which deserves to be remembered. 
and I'll leave some links to some more information on these people below. Just keep in mind when reading up about some of these people, some of the terminologies and understandings stated are very outdated, particularly in regards to asexuality, but also if you're reading up on Magnus Hirschfeld, there's some outdated terminology used towards trans people. In 1922, Jenny June wrote The Female Impersonators. June wrote on sexual and gender nonconformity, and in this work it described people known as anaphrodites. June describes, their minds are devoid of hero worship, and they shudder violently at the very thought of any kind of association grounded on sex differences. Their anaphroditism is either an after effect of an illness in childhood or congenital. It's pretty inaccurate. Most definitions of asexuality were at this time. Magnus Hirschfeld kind of got the closest in saying, sexuality isn't caused by anything. It's not a choice. It's just how people are born. In fact, there are a lot more writings on early definitions of asexuality that are out there, but I chose not to include them all. In a lot of them, they're not actually referring to asexuality. Rather, they might have been referring to people who deliberately chose to be celibate. One even described asexuality as a jealousy psychosis. Some implied that those who were asexual were choosing not to have sex to keep hidden some kind of inner perverted desire. People were throwing this word around and they really had no clue what it meant. Nor had anyone come up with a solid definition by this point. And this is going to continue for many decades to come, so buckle up. In 1948, the Kinsey Scrail was created. It was first published in Sexual Behaviour in Human Males. And the scale accounted for research showing that people didn't exclusively fit into homosexual or heterosexual categories. Sexuality is a spectrum, who knew? On this scale, there are options one to six, as well as an additional category of X, which represented no social sexual contacts or reactions. Yet another acknowledgement of early understandings of asexuality. The term asexual is not used in the Kinsey report, but he does describe that people who fall into the category of X are those with a low sex drive. Kinsey doesn't do the best job at defining asexuality, he kind of got the whole thing wrong, but there is one aspect of it he understand better than Magnus Hirschfeld or anyone who came before him. He stated, whether the factors are biologic, psychologic, or social, it is certain that such persona exists. But such an activity is no more sublimation of sex drive than blindness or deafness or other perceptive defects are subliminal of those categories. More importantly, Kinsey took the stance that considerable psychiatric therapy can be wasted on persons, especially females, who are misjudged to be cases of repression when, in actuality, at least some of them were never equipped to respond erotically. Kinsey seemed to understand that sexuality was a natural and uncontrollable part of a person, and that we weren't to be treated as those with a medical condition. The idea that asexual people have some kind of hormonal imbalance or low sex drive is a stereotype and misconception that still affects us to this day. But we have known the truth since 1948. We were just born this way. I'd play Lady Gaga, but you know, YouTube copyright laws. These are the key milestones in the development of our understanding of asexuality from the late 19th century to early 20th century. I completely messed up that sentence. You can figure out what I meant. So I thought that I'd wrap this up by talking about a famous asexual figure. You've probably heard about him in school, stories about chilling out under apple trees, discovering gravity. That's right, we're talking about Isaac Newton. I first learned about this through a TikTok by Rainbow History Class, who is an amazing group who you should definitely go follow. Newton was very focused on discovering the inner workings of the universe, so perhaps he just didn't have the time for sex or romance. But supposedly his lack of passion was spoken about him as an oddity. On his deathbed at age 84, Newton confessed that he had never known a woman. There's a lot of speculation, since he stated a woman, that Newton was gay or homosexual. But a close friend of him remarked after his death that he was never sensible to any passion, was not subject to the common frailties of mankind, nor had he any commerce with a woman, a circumstance which was assured by the physician and surgeon who attended him in his last moments. He wasn't interested in anyone, which led many to believe that Isaac Newton was asexual. Other historical figures who have now been interpreted as asexual include Nikola Tesla and H.P. Lovecraft. 
And that concludes this episode about the history of asexuality. Next episode is going to be entirely dedicated to one asexual figure. A figure who has always had a fascination with society, especially her death. But recently aspects of her sexuality have been brought into light. And I want to shed some more light on her inner struggles of being someone who is potentially a sapro-romantic asexual when the world viewed her as a sex symbol. So make sure you subscribe to see that episode, I think it's going to be one that's really important. And if you did enjoy this video, please support the series by liking this video. If it could get the same amount of views as the last episode, that would just be awesome. Oh, you know what? Even half of the views of the last episode, I'd be alright with that. So thank you guys so much for watching. Bye!